Hello students. In this video, we're going to go through the proof of the mean value theorem for definite intervals. I think this is a worthwhile exercise, especially when considering the uh, Taylor series remainder term. So let's proceed. All right, so we're going to use the fact that f of x is continuous on this interval. And this may seem a little bit strange, but g of x does not change sign. That means g of x will always be positive or always be negative on a, b. And uh, the conclusion of the proof goes that there exists some c in the open interval a, b, such that it looks like f attains some value here at c, and you know we it looks like we're just you know pulling it out of the integral. Um, you'll see that sleight of hand later in the uh, in the proof but this is the statement so of the mean value theorem so the g of x stays within the integral and the f of c is multiplied by the uh, by the integral all right so let's proceed with the proof So since f is continuous and g of x is greater than or equal to 0 on a, b, then by the extreme value theorem, f attains uh, its maximum and minimum values. Okay, So f is bounded below by little m and bounded above by capital M, and it actually attains the values. And you'll see that since f is continuous, uh, we'll use the intermediate value theorem later to you know point out that f of x actually attains those values between little m and big M, all right? So uh, you've seen this before when you found maxes or mins using first derivatives and uh, second derivatives of concavity and such. So that is the extreme value theorem. All right, so we're going to use this, this fact, and I'm going to clean this up, so I'm going to get rid of all of this material here. I'm going to clean this up and just um, focus on this term now. So we have f is bounded between a lower bound and an upper bound for all of x on a, b. And since g of x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x and a, b, we can just multiply this inequality by g of x, and we do not change the direction of the inequality. Property of definite integrals now, we just integrate each side of the inequality, and then we factor out the constant m, little m, and the constant capital M. And now we have something that looks like uh, closer to what we're trying to prove here. All right, now uh, we have to consider the case. What happens if this integral is equal to 0? Okay, so we just multiplied everything in this inequality by 0. Well, if the integral happens to be equal to 0, then you have that this integral with this product in here is bounded you know, by zero on each side, so that just means that it's equal to zero. But keep in mind that g of x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, if g of x happens to be equal to zero, then there's nothing to prove here, okay? This whole thing is just equal to zero, and that's just a trivial case. But if g of x is greater than zero, then the only way that this integral here is going to actually equal to zero is if there's some place where f actually attains zero. Now, think about that. If g is greater than 0, and this integral happens to be equal to 0. If f happened to be greater than 0, then you'd be multiplying a positive term times a positive term. There's absolutely no way that this integral could be a 0 if you have both of these positive. You'd be accumulating area, right? Um, and likewise, if g was positive and f was negative, then you'd be accumulating a lot of area. Um, in the negative direction, you never attain zero. So that means there has to be some place where f attains zero. And so, boom, you just pick that point C where f attains zero, and then you pull it out of the integral, and you're done. Now, let's go and suppose that g of x is, uh, the integral of g of x over this interval is greater than zero. Then that means we could take this term here and divide everything by the integral of g of x. And since we're assuming that the integral of g of x is greater than 0, um, we can, we're not dividing by 0. And we're not changing the direction of inequalities. Now keep in mind, 
you might say, well, what happens if g of x is less than or equal to zero? No problem. You're just the proof will still be the same proof. You're just going to change the direction of the inequalities. You'll still end up with the same proof, though. Okay, so now we're going to focus on this term here. So f is continuous on AB. So by the intermediate value theorem that I mentioned before at the beginning of this video, there's a c in the interval a to b, so that f of c actually attains the values between attains that you know maximum value between m little m and capital M. That means, in other words, this term here is actually equal to some f of c. And so now the proof is essentially complete. Let me clean this up. So we have this inequality, and by the intermediate value theorem, f of c is equal to this thing in the middle, this quotient in the middle. And so now we're just going to do a little, little bit of algebra, and we're going to multiply this term over on this side, and we get the result that we're looking for. This integral of this product, f times g, is equal to f of c times the integral of g of x from a to b. And so this is the mean value over this interval that we are um, factoring out of the integral. And that is the mean value theorem for definite integrals. All right, good luck.